Hi everyone, I'm Anuka the Reason, fertility physician and doctor mom, and here to educate on fertility. In this video, we'll be talking about fresh versus frozen transfers and what factors are involved when making the decision to proceed with either a fresh or frozen transfer. So let's start that discussion now. <music> What is a fresh embryo transfer and a frozen embryo transfer? In a fresh embryo transfer, in the same cycle that the IVF cycle is being done, we will put back the embryo. So after the ovarian stimulation, after the egg retrieval, after the eggs are fertilized in the lab and the embryos are allowed to grow out to either day three or day five, when the embryo is still fresh, we'll put the embryo back into the woman's uterus either three or five days after the egg retrieval, typically more at five days after the egg retrieval. So that's a fresh embryo transfer. This is versus a frozen embryo transfer where the embryo was previously frozen, whether that was a prior IVF cycle, the month prior, or maybe sometimes years prior. And so in that case, the uterus is prepared for the embryo transfer with some medications. And then once the uterus is ready for the transfer, the embryo is thawed and then placed back into the uterus. So those are the main differences between a fresh embryo transfer and a frozen embryo transfer. With either a fresh or frozen embryo transfer cycle, we're trying to get the lining of the uterus or the endometrium to a certain thickness and with a certain quality. In terms of the thickness, that can vary a little bit clinic to clinic, but generally speaking, we're aiming for about seven millimeters in thickness. In terms of the quality, what we're looking for is a trilaminar appearance where it has this three line appearance. And we're assessing both of these with transvaginal ultrasound. With a fresh transfer cycle, the woman has undergone the process of IVF, so theoretically multiple follicles are there and growing. Each follicle is producing estrogen, and that estrogen will stimulate the lining of the uterus to thicken. And so usually in a fresh transfer cycle, the lining gets to the appropriate thickness because theoretically multiple follicles are there. This is opposed to the frozen embryo transfers. There's um, a few different protocols that we use for frozen embryo transfers. The first one is what's called a medicated frozen embryo transfer cycle. In this cycle, we give estrogen to thicken the lining of the uterus. And the estrogen can be in different forms. It could be oral pills, it could be vaginal pills, it could be a patch. If we're having difficulty getting the lining to the right thickness, it can be injections or other adjuncts that we'll add on. But in this cycle, the woman is not producing any follicles. Her ovaries are remaining quiet and we're giving the medications to thicken the lining of the uterus. The next type of protocol for a frozen embryo transfer is a what I call a stimulated frozen embryo transfer protocol, where we're giving some medications with the goal of the woman growing two or three follicles that cycle. Some of the medications we can use are letrozole, or sometimes some of the injections that we use for the IVF cycle, but in lower doses, for example, gonal F, folistin, menopure. And in that type of cycle, the woman's making her own estrogen that is coming from the production of her own follicles. And then we're piggybacking off of her cycle for when we would perform the embryo transfer. And then the last cycle is what's called a natural cycle where the woman is not taking any medications usually and we're just following her in her cycle to see when that follicle gets to the right size and the lining gets to the right thickness. And again, we'll piggyback off of the woman's cycle for when we perform the embryo transfer. So these are examples of the different types of protocols that we use. Studies have also shown some differences when it comes to fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles and pregnancy outcomes. There have been some studies that have showed a slightly increased pregnancy rate in frozen embryo transfers compared to fresh. There have also been some studies that have looked at differences in pregnancy outcomes between fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles. For example, frozen embryo transfer cycles being associated with a lower ectopic pregnancy rate, a lower preterm delivery rate, and a lower rate of low birth weight babies and small for gestational age babies. The speculation for why the differences might be is that with a fresh IVF cycle, the estrogen level gets quite high and higher than it would compared to a normal cycle. And so we wonder sometimes, does that high estrogen level have any sort of adverse effect on the lining of the uterus compared to a frozen embryo transfer cycle where the estrogen level does not get as high and is more physiologically similar in that way to a normal cycle. 
So these are some of the additional factors to consider when we're choosing between a fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycle. Over the years, frozen embryo transfers have become more common, and there are certain scenarios where we lean more towards recommending them. So some examples of those scenarios are, if for example, a woman has undergone an IVF cycle, and if she's done a transfer, and if that transfer was unsuccessful. Sometimes a cycle may result in a negative pregnancy test or a pregnancy loss. That could be, for example, a biochemical pregnancy, an ectopic pregnancy, or a miscarriage. If that woman had extra embryos frozen during the IVF cycle, then we can move forward with another attempt at putting the embryo back in. Another example is if a woman is at high risk for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Women who are at high risk for this are going to be young with a high AMH, a high follicle count, a low BMI, um, having a high estrogen during the IVF cycle. If a woman is at risk for this, we do not want to put the embryo back in in a fresh cycle because that could exacerbate the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is not what we want. Another example is if the woman had a high progesterone during the IVF cycle. In those cases, we worry about the lining of the uterus and the embryo being out of sync, and that could potentially decrease implantation rate. Another example is if the couple have decided to do PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing, which is genetically testing the embryos to see which ones are uh, chromosomally normal, and also we could know the gender of the embryos. In couples that have decided to do this, we need to wait for the results, which take about two to three weeks. So we would freeze the embryos, wait for the results, decide which embryo we're choosing to put back in, and then proceed with the transfer cycle. A last example is if we are suspicious for some sort of uterine abnormality that could be a polyp or a fibroid that's impacting the cavity. Sometimes during the IVF cycle, we'll become suspicious if a polyp is present. So in those cases, we do not want to proceed with a fresh transfer because we worry about that uterine abnormality potentially decreasing pregnancy rates. There have been some scenarios though where we do consider a fresh transfer. So an example of that would be, let's say a couple have previously undergone an IVF cycle and let's say their embryos did not make it to the blastocyst stage. Sometimes couples really want to give that transfer a try and so they are open to doing a fresh transfer. So it really depends on the patient and the clinical scenario where we may lean more towards a fresh or frozen embryo transfer. So definitely discuss this with your healthcare provider. That is it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, I hope you'll give the video a like. Don't forget to subscribe down below. If you have comments or questions, you can leave them for me there also. Thank you again so much for watching and see you in the next video.